real quickly to kind of get things started before we get into the meat of the subject today. Um, if you're here and you're in the chat, uh, for one, let me know where you're from. And for two, just greet everybody. Show some good, uh, some good kind of friendliness. As has already been uh, broadcasted abroad. Today's actual topic is going to be mixing bass. Uh, I put cakewalk by in cakewalk by band line. However, this is going to be applicable to any DAW because what I'm going to do is basically cover um, just pretty much anything and everything that has to do with bass guitar or at least give you some really quick actionable tips so that whenever you're messing with and it doesn't yet again doesn't have to be bass guitar basically just anything that is very bass heavy um just give you some really good quick actionable tips some things that you can oh sorry Um, okay. Not sure why. Let me see if I can. Uh, is that gone? Is the echoing gone? Sincerely apologize about that. I think I have my. There was like a, a loop. On the mic here. I think is what happened. All right, let me try to figure it out. Oh, wow, that sounds cool. Okay. All right, All right. That? Not sure if that's that. Uh, yeah. All right, we are currently experiencing some technical difficulties. Yeah, I'm not sure why that's happening. Oh, no, what? <laughs> oh, man. Hey, is that better? <laughs> oh, this is awesome. No, don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere, guys. I figured it out. Oh, my goodness. Woo. Wow. Okay, so 
<laughs> so you want to know what this one was? So the other night I was all distraught because, uh, now this is like stuff that happens in the real world, stuff that happens on live streams. This is why they're, they're so much fun. So I have my microphone, the SM7B, running through about three different pieces of hardware right now to try to get at this sound that I'm achieving. And I have the very last thing in the chain is called the uh, Virtualizer 3D. And I actually had it on a delay slash reverb setting. So, um, yeah, you'll have that man alive. This stuff only happens on live videos. This is a great. It's live though. You know, what are you, what are you going to do about it? All right. So, um, anyway, let's, uh, let's go back to the, All right, let's go back to the, um, <clears throat> where we started at here. Woo. All right. We were talking about mixing bass and cakewalk by band lab, but what I was saying was it's not specific to cakewalk by band lab, regardless of what DAW that you're using, you can utilize the tips that I'm going to be giving you today. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be for the bass guitar. This could also be applicable to anything that's bass heavy. Um, it could be across the board, like an entire mix, or even, you know, you could narrow it down to, uh, even just one instrument. So I'm hoping that I can give you some really quick actionable tips that you can take away from here today. And you'll be able to utilize in your mixes, your masters, your recording, even your tracking. All right. So with that being said, and now that we've got past all of that, um, I did post a link in the chat already. You'll see it's one of the first uh, things that I posted that came from me, which is highlighted in yellow there. That link will take you to basically a, a free download that will cover everything that we're going to talk about today, um, sort of more in depth. And that way you've got something you can kind of, you know, stick on your Kindle or put it in your back pocket, put it on the phone. You got something, you know, where you can carry it around with you. And periodically... As we move through this, if that link that I've already provided gets lost in the chat section, let me know and I will repost that link for you to download. Obviously, it's going to be in the description of the video as well, too. So no need to worry about that as well. And without further ado, let's go ahead and um, dive into some of what we'll be talking about today. So if you're new here, this is your first time here, greatly appreciate you stopping by. Just wanted to let you know that the, uh, the channel itself exists to simplify the complexities of the home studio and to help you make professional sounding music in a less than professional space. And if you've been around here any number of minutes or moments, days, you know too that the motto around here is dream, create, achieve, and all of this is done better when it's done together. And I'm, given this particular time that we're in right now during this whole coronavirus thing, we have needed unity now more than we ever have needed unity. And um, so without further ado, let's move on to the next portion of this, which I always love this portion. I want to do this. Let's talk about the HSS chart toppers. Of course, HSS stands for Home Studio Simplified Chart Toppers. We're looking at James Sheets here coming in at number one with a donation of $10 to keep the channel going. And Zave Ryan, my man, has uh, given a generous portion of $5. So he was bumped out of his first first chart topper position, but that's all right. You got, you guys are, are rocking. And, and really, no amount of, of money will be uh, scoffed at if you guys give anything from a dollar all the way up to, you know, a thousand, whatever. It's going to be awesome either way. And anyone who gives any dollar amount today is going to get a freebie from me. All right. The next thing that we're going to talk about, and we're just kind of getting through the preliminaries right now, waiting for people to get on board, jump on board before we really get into the meat of the subject. But the next thing we're going to talk about is the song challenge. So posted in the description of this video 
is the um, link where you can actually upload your submission to the song challenge. If you're not familiar as to what the song challenge is, basically in order to break up the monotony and help with um, everybody being able to have something to do during this trying time, I wanted to um, go ahead and create something for some individuals who are creative like ourselves. That way we can... Um, Sorry, I got sidetracked there. Shiny object. But anyway, I created this song challenge so that all of us who are currently quarantined or locked in our rooms and houses would have something to do. And it's really just a fun way to sort of interact with one another. We all get to hear each other's music styles. And um, so this is kind of a cool way to do that, though. But you can follow that link and upload your submission there. I do have all over the place that I've posted this. I do have the stipulations, which they're not too too heavy um but then once you upload that i will be having during a live session we will be listening to the songs together we'll all take turns voting on which one we thought was the best the one that gets the most votes will then be mixed and mastered by me for the free and um you'll get the uh recognition of being recognized as having the best uh mixed song that you have the best version of your song so with that being said, moving on from the song challenge, uh, James Sheet says, Robert, your gear recommendations list is broken on your website. Nothing is listed. Yeah, as of right now, Amazon is doing something crazy, and that link that you go to on my website um, is actually, I think it's it's a different link than what's actually posted, so I'll have to fix that. I appreciate you pointing that out, by the way. I need to make note of that. Because if you go to the, my website and you go to Studio Gear, it's essentially the same thing. It's all of the same stuff that I recommend. And um, it's just all in one centralized location. Um, but I think Amazon messed my link up that I include in my description of my videos. So thank you so much, by the way, for pointing that out. I'm sorry. I'm trying to write this down real quick. Fix link in video for gear recommendations. Okay. I just posted uh, really quickly a link to that page too for those uh, gear recommendations in case you were wanting to go and check those out. All right. So we've talked about the song challenge. We've talked about the chart toppers, James Sheets and Zay Bryan, two awesome dudes who helped out. And the way that you can get on the top of the chart is just by simply donating through the Super Chat, which is the small S icon that's located if you're on a mobile at the bottom right hand. If you're on a desktop, it'd be at the bottom left hand. It just kind of looks like an S or a money symbol. And uh, that little slider will pop up. What that does is you can donate anything from a dollar all the way to, you know, whatever you want. And then it will put your question at the very top of the stack and it will guarantee that your question gets answered if you have a question. And also you'll be put in the chart toppers and you'll receive a freebie. So let's move on to the live chat screen. Got that looking just a little bit different today. Thought we'd kind of get something uh, going on there and make it look a little bit different. Kind of sw switch things up a little bit. So um, we're talking about mixing bass. And as I said, this is not specific to Cakewalk by BandLab. This is, you know, anything that requires... Uh, bass guitar. Um, uh, Zave, I am going to apologize. I'm gonna apologize. I am going to have to remove that uh, explicative that you put there on the chat as I try to keep this channel as clean as possible. So don't be offended in me, but I got to do that. Okay. So moving on, we are going to be talking about the bass guitar. Now, I'm going to go ahead and pull up a session two for um, Cakewalk by BandLab. That way I can show you things if need be. But the main thing I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of talk through some things at first just to kind of get the preliminaries out of the way. So the bass is a crazy instrument, okay? And it's one of those things that if you don't get it right in a mix, it can literally destroy a mix. Um, and the reason why it is so sometimes uh, hard to 
sort of beat into submission is just simply the fact that there's a lot of information that's going on when you're talking about bass frequencies. Now, if you're in a room, say for instance, regardless of the room's size, when a bass frequency leaves a speaker, when it leaves um, some sort of a, a source, whether that's a speaker or an amplifier, whatever it may be, a mixing board, whatever it may be, if it's putting sound into the atmosphere, that bass frequency is going to be, uh, it, it's larger, so therefore it fills up more space um, in the room. And that's why bass traps typically are thicker than um, like broadband absorbers or, or high frequency absorbers, which are tend to be a, a little bit thinner. That thinner material can catch the high frequencies easier just simply because the high frequencies are very small. If you look at a waveform, I'll try to bring one up here for you. Um, let's see. Let's go with, actually, I'll bring up a pretty bass heavy mix here too. So we can kind of get a good representation of exactly what I'm talking about. So bass frequencies are, generally speaking, large. They're huge. And when you collapse them into a small space, like a room or something like that, they take up a lot of space. Same thing in a mix. Your mix is essentially kind of like a room in and of itself, so to speak. And so what happens is the bass frequencies, because they're so large, because they take up so much information, when you get too many of those bass frequencies in a mix, they have a tendency to like drown one another out. They have a tendency to fight one another. And that's where a lot of times our undefined bass sounds come from. So just real quickly, um, if I go to the desktop here, this is a mix that I'm currently working on with an artist, Adamental, and the reason why I chose this mix in particular is simply because it's very bass heavy. It's the, the genre that it's in. Um, he is a Christian hip hop artist, and so this hip hop is very bass heavy. So I'm going to show you some things that I have done in this particular mix to try to tame that bass beast, to try to get that, that bass kind of tamed into submission, so to speak. Uh, real quickly though, let's listen to where the bass is setting now in context with the mix and then you can kind of hear it for yourself exactly what I'm talking about so I'm gonna go ahead and um, hit play on this and just let you kind of listen to this for a moment let me make sure that I got the volume up here so it's not but not too loud okay I apologize I got that routed wrong Okay, let's check it out. I used to cruise through life with eyelids closed on autopilot. No concern for anything outside my cushy life in private. I was the silent type because I was pacified by blindness. Blue pills so oblivious to how the devil moves with slyness. He turns the heat up slow to make the world into his likeness. If we're not alert, we'll buy into his self-destructive guidance. Dismiss the darkness on the screen. It's just some mindless violence. And believe whatever the TV man says, there's no bias. Yeah, I see the game, I know the tactics to divide us Lie to us and beat us down until we're in compliance Use phony terms like hate speech to scare us into silence Indoctrinate our kids to implant the leftist virus They're hoping that we're spineless or too polite to be defiant This evil will grow unless the righteous stand up and fight it We need the red pill, the holy bible Okay, so you get kind of the, the gist of this now you can definitely see that this is a uh, obviously very bass heavy. There's a lot going on here in the bass regions. And so this would be a perfect example then to show you exactly what you can do when concerning the bass in this particular instance. But like I said, this is going to be applicable to uh, nearly anything that you might mix or have to do with that has bass added to it. So let's go ahead and look at the bass itself. Now this is a VSTI instrument. So generally speaking, when you work with VSTs, VSTI instruments, 
the bass guitar itself sounds a lot better than what you would right out of the gate, a lot better than what you might be able to um, record it. And the reason being is just simply because uh, VSTi instruments are usually played off of sample libraries, and those sample libraries have been recorded in multi-million dollar studios with excellent sound, you know, and or for that matter, they might be even digitally reproduced. And so they're already pretty much ready to go right out of the gate. In fact, when I get songs that are very um, mixed, mixed heavy, heavily with MIDI, I find that I really don't have to do so much to those instruments just simply because they already sound pretty much like what they're supposed to sound like. So I'm already getting winded. Okay. So on this particular bass track, one of the things that I've done in this particular mix that has allowed this bass to poke through is I've actually done what's called sidechain compression on the bass track. And I've sidechained the bass to the kick drum so that essentially um, when those two elements, which are very bass heavy, are in a mix and they're fighting for attention, when the kick drum uh, goes off, the transient then triggers. Uh, greetings, Keith. Good to see you, buddy. And corals, plants, fish. Good day to you as well. Um, but basically, when the transient of the kick goes off, it forces that compressor to then turn the bass down. And it only does it for about a second. It's just long enough for that uh, initial transient of the kick drum to poke through there. Rosso, what's up, buddy? Okay, so I'm going to show you this on screen now through this compressor. Now, this is the stock compressor that comes with Cakewalk by BandLab. As most of you already know, if you've watched several of these videos, I love to use stock com stock plugins on this because they simply, they just work. They're amazing. Now, the GUIs or the GUIs, as some people like to call them, the user interfaces, aren't necessarily up to speed. Yes, sir, I am talking about some side chaining. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. This was going to be like farther down the line when I talked about that, but I'm going to get into it anyway. Um, but essentially, you know, although the, the plugins don't necessarily look the greatest, they work amazingly, and that's all that really matters. I'm not so much worried about how fancy they look. In fact, what I've noticed is some pl plugins look so fancy but do so little that it's almost like, why did I even purchase this? So Keith loves side chaining, apparently. <laughs> So keep a close eye on this compressor here, especially these levels. This is my um, audio input uh, level here coming in. So uh, loud music, by the way. Coming in three, two, and one. I used to cruise through life with eyelids closed on autopilot. No concern for anything outside my cushy life in private. I was the silent type because I was pacified by blindness. Blue pills so oblivious to how the devil moves with slyness. He turns the heat up slow to make the world. All right, so as you can see, I'm getting 6 dBs of gain reduction. And my attack settings are at 10 milliseconds, which is very fast. That's fast enough for the transient of the kick drum once it goes off to tell this compressor you're side chained to that kick now you have to do whatever that kick is telling you to so the way that i kind of in my mind think about this is side chaining so there's a chain that's tied to whatever you've got it's tied to the side of it and whenever whatever you have that side chain routed to is sort of uh, the boss of that audio then that thing will jerk that thing's chain and say, nope, you're, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. So that's kind of one way to look at side chaining, just sort of a, a parabolic, I guess, if you want to call it that. Um, but basically what's happening here is that kick drum is, is yanking that chain on that bass and saying, well, you're going to come down about six dBs. And the release time is at 20 milliseconds. So that's long enough for the transient of the kick to go through as well as just enough of the tail end of that transient to where it sounds actually like the kick is coming through. Um, sometimes if you do this too fast, you get only the transient and then the bass shoots up so quickly that you lose that initial kick sound. So you got to do this kind of sparingly, but you have to do it right. And the, obviously the biggest thing that you want to do is use, of course, your ears. Um, in anything that has to do with audio, obviously you want to use your ears. I'm going to uh, go ahead over to the, um, where am I at here? 
Okay, so yeah, that that's uh, side chaining. Sorry, I was checking on the comments real quick. So that's side chaining, and we've talked a little bit about that. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is the actual EQ of a bass guitar, because a lot of times um, when people EQ a bass guitar, they th they think that you have to leave all of that bass in there, when in actuality the bass guitar has a lot of harmonic frequencies that happen in the lower regions, subregions, and those are a lot of times frequencies that you don't necessarily need to make that bass guitar sound like a bass guitar. And so in this instance here, if I open up this pro channel, you're going to see that um, I've actually cut out quite a bit of those bass frequencies by a, a, attenuating a high pass filter at 40 hertz. Now, a lot of people would say, well, that's too much. You don't want to attenuate at 40 especially with a curve of a slope of 12, because now you're going to cut out all those precious bass sounds. But in all actuality, uh, what's, what's happening here is all I'm doing is getting rid of the stuff that I don't even need, the stuff that's actually not going to benefit to the rest of the mix, because there are other bass heavy instruments that's actually playing at the same time. We got synths going on. We've got kick drums going on. We've got um, pads going on. Um, the, the artist's voice itself is it uh, resonates pretty well in the lower regions. So you got to take all this into account. So that's actually kind of, um, I could probably even go farther with this. In fact, I think if I played it back, uh, loud noise, by the way, in three, two, and one. I used to cruise through life with eyelids closed on autopilot. No concern for anything outside my cushy life in private. I was the silent type because I was pacified by blindness. Blue pills so oblivious to how the devil moves with slyness. He turns the heat up slow to make the world into his likeness. If we're not alert, we'll buy into his self-destructive guidance. Dismiss the darkness on the screen. It's just some mindless violence. And believe whatever the TV man says, there's no bias. Yeah, I see the... Okay, so what I did there, and this is another tip that I wanted to give you guys. Whenever you're you're cutting these bass frequencies, um, you can see I went all the way up to 50 now. I took that that high pass all the way up to 50. Now that would be like to some people their their heads would explode. Like why in the world is he high passing that high? But to accentuate that, I actually went a little bit farther above that. We can see here on the the frequency region of 80 hertz and boosted. So basically like just after that curve starts to taper off is where I put my boost. And by doing that, what you're doing, especially with cakewalk plugins, because a lot of cakewalk plugins under the hood have these things. <laughs> Keith says the EQ curve looks like a fat cat looking over the fence. So basically what you have a lot of times with these cakewalk plugins though, is built under the hood is a, uh, this intrinsic value of analog processing because one thing that cakewalk has tried to do like ever since the olden ye olden days is they wanted to be a daw that would reproduce uh correctly analog sound now i don't think honestly i don't think there's very many companies that have got to that point yet but cakewalk comes very close to it especially when you begin to enable um, the console emulators on every channel across the board. In fact, I've got a video on my channel where I do just that, and I talk about how that um, you can basically turn your DAW, this DAW, into a console by doing that. And when you disable all of those, it's a dramatic difference. But when you enable them and you're mixing through them and all of this stuff happens, you're, you're not really hearing too much of that happen. So you're thinking, well, is this even... It's just even working, but in all actuality, when you enable them all again and you hear all of it, you got to bypass and and hit that bypass button every once in a while. It just really helps to hear what's actually happening. So, um, apart from this looking like a, a fat cat looking over a fence, you'll notice too that there's a large boost here around um, the 587 region. Now, generally speaking, this um, this is not a good region to boost. In fact, this is typically where I cut, but this is that thing yet again, where you have to use your ears when it comes to mixing. There is, I don't care how good the mix engineer is. And if they're really that good, they will tell you, um, and they won't lie to you. They will tell you like it's based off a of source material. 
Um, it's based off of the mix itself. What do you want to shine at that particular moment? It's based off the instrument and even the player because the same bass player can pick up the same guitar or the same bass guitar rather, the same with the same strings, the same pick, the same amp, everything, but he'll sound completely different because the tone is all in the fingers. It's in the, how that person plays it. And so essentially I could, you know, go out on a limb like I've seen some channels do and it, it irks me when they do this. And they'll say, oh yeah, you always want to cut at this region or you always want to boost at this region. And what that does is that gives you guys this false sense of hope that if I do that in every mix, then it's going to sound great. And then what happens is you do that and it sounds like junk and you're going, well, what happened? I did what they told me to do. So you have to take this into consideration as far as the entire mix is concerned. And you have to take this into consideration when basing it upon the source. So as of here, I uh, kind of digressed, but as of here, I am boosting that area that I would normally not boost just simply because this mix is lacking in that area. And later on, as we get through some of these live streams or you look through some of my videos, I'll show you how I knew that it was lacking in that area and how I can pretty much use a couple of different plugins to almost like a, a doctor would, would analyze something. I can analyze the mix with the, the couple of these visual aids and, and look at it and go, okay, this area here, um, it's lacking in. So there's instruments that I know that have fundamentals. That's a key word, by the way, fundamentals in that region, in that frequency region that I can boost without it sounding bad or ruining the mix. Okay. So I've got, I've got coffee in me, by the way, if you guys don't like coffee, there's something wrong with you. I mean, I understand there's people that don't like it, but there's still, there's, there's something wrong with you if you don't like coffee. Ah, this is the Nantucket blend, by the way. I prefer usually the uh, Dark Magic blend, but this, oh yeah, this is good for right now. It's good on the old throat. All right, so moving on in the, uh, <laughs> moving on in the uh, pro channel here. The next thing that I've got in line after this is the CA2A. Now this is basically a limiter. Well, it is, it is a limiter. It's a brick wall limiter. You can set it to work like a compressor or you can set it to work like a limiter. I have it on the limit setting. Now, generally speaking, when I work with a bass guitar, I will always put a limiter on it. Unless of course, it's like um, a jazz ensemble. Jazz bass does not need a limiter. It, it's too delicate. It does not need a limiter. Um, unless you're gonna automate it, which that's kind of cool too. But if it's a bass heavy song like this, I'm going to slap a limiter on that. And the reason being because this is another quick tip um, that should be in those notes that I talked about. Whenever you slap a limiter on the bass, it takes away those inconsistency, those, those dynamic changes that dynamics are great. Don't, don't get me wrong. Dynamics are great for acoustic guitars. Dynamics are great for vocals. Dynamics are great for um, certain instruments, piano, another, that's another one. Uh, however, when it comes to a bass guitar, the dynamics are not so much important because the bass guitar is sort of like the backbone, much like the kick drum and, and of the drums. It's sort of like the backbone that keeps that song really like vibing and it gets you, you know, wrapped in it. And if you, at any point you hear like the bass, like coming in and going out and, you're not really sure if it's there or not, and it's inaudible one second, the next minute it's booming back in. It, it has a tendency to get you kind of like de detached from the mix. You, you get disconnected from it, if you understand what I mean. And so um, in this instance, and in, you know, when you're working with songs like this, slap a limiter on there. Now this is one of those things that yet again, you have to use your ears as um, Keith is already, or I'm sorry, Coral, Corals, Plants, and Fish has already said in the chat, ears before rules. And that's so true. You got to use your ears. So the thing about this is when I do this, it's going to allow that to be the backbone, like what it's intended to do, especially in hip hop. In this particular genre, they want lots of bass. And that's probably, it was probably by the artists um, whenever they sent me a revision for this. I, I tend to send out things that are less bass heavy. Um, and then they can tell me later if they want more bass, just simply because I don't know what people are listening back to on sometimes. And a lot of times people usually typically will stick it in their car and they've never adjusted the EQ in their car. 
And so it's usually on the rock setting, which is usually bass heavy. So I'm almost positive that Adamantle sent this back and said, hey, I need some more bass. But this is a bass heavy genre. So with all that being said, now it's it's the backbone because I've slapped this limiter on it. I want you to, to look closely at this limiter. I'm going to take my mug off the screen for a minute here. And um, so take a look at this limiter as the, the bass is playing and watch exactly what it's doing. This may be an eye opener to some of you. So uh, loud music in three, two, and one. I used to cruise through life with eyelids closed on autopilot. No concern for anything outside my cushy life in private. I was the silent type because I was pacified by blindness. Blue pills so oblivious to how the devil moves with slyness. All right. So as you can see, that limiter is being crushed. But if you noticed, the limiter was also pretty much maintaining a steady needle right in the center there at around negative 2, negative 3 dBs. So what what's all that about? Why is that cool? Well, like I said, that's causing that bass guitar to do what it's intended to do. It's causing it to um, just basically ride right through there. So I know some individuals, like even last night I had an individual, I think it might have even been um, John, was talking about um, the bass writer and vocal writer plugins by Waves. Um, as much as I... I'll, I'll zip my mouth about waves, but as much as I have seen those being put to use and they do work, don't get me wrong. They do work. This will, will do so much more, um, in terms of keeping things level. Now, if you want that, uh, bass writer, honestly, in my opinion, would be really great, uh, for jazz ensembles yet again, where you can kind of set that to, to be a little bit less, a little more dynamic rather, but a little less uh, overbearing. Where in instances like this, this works perfect. This does amazing things. So um, moving on down past that, we have the console emulator. And I've got this set to the A type, which is the way that I like to, to look at these the console emulators that's found within Cakewalk. Now this is not how they wrote it into their documentation. So don't, you know, quote this word for word and you know say that uh, that's what this is this is how I personally remember this uh, this console C you'll see that it has three different types a S type an N type and an A type so the way that I see this and the way that I hear it with my ears is the S is subtle the N is kind of like a neutral and then the A is aggressive just kind of an easy way to remember that so you'll see I've got this console emulation set on aggressive. And generally speaking too, when I use one console emulation, I try to use the same console emulation across the board. That way it kind of gives this consistency. Now I don't have the drive turned all the way up on this simply because this bass guitar is already very uh, gritty and grungy kind of sounding. So I didn't necessarily need that. Another thing that I would make mention of that's not typically normal is the fact that this bass was sent to me in stereo. Now a bass guitar is a mono instrument. It does not need to be in stereo. Um, so the fact that this is in stereo, that they sent, sent it to me like that, lets me know that uh, for whatever reason, that's how their program recorded it. Now I could get all like overboard crazy about this and say it has to be in mono every single time. But yet again, like I spoke of the other night, there there's really not any rules when it comes to this stuff and that's one of those rules that definitely can be uh, side you know sidestepped so all right so let's go to the chat section real quick because I think I've got some stuff that's coming up in there maybe I could answer some questions or at least jump on and kind of chat with you guys for a minute I've kind of rambled on about the same bass track for a minute I want to kind of bounce back and forth okay so Keith says very confusing for me I'm not sure what comes with band lab anymore um, oh that's right you guys are talking about the um, the stuff that's coming in cakewalk okay do, 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 do. yeah it was available with uh, the original version of sonar the CL2A or CA2A sorry it, there's so much alike. 
I also acquired mine, Keith, during the Gibson days, uh, along with many other plugins that a lot of people, when I'm giving these tutorials and stuff, they see those plugins and are like, dude, where did you get that? I need that. And I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry, but you, you can't get it anymore. <laughs> I'm sure there's somewhere where you can buy them, but I'm not sure where. Um, what does the tolerance do? Oh, okay. So I did a very in-depth, very in-depth, um, sort of encapsulation of what exactly everything does on the pro channel. In fact, I have a video on my Cakewalk by BandLab tutorials playlist that goes like very in-depth. Um, However, basically, so if it, if it, if this was a real console, let's, let's take it into these, these terms. And like I said, Cakewalk is always like really big on trying to make sure that they wanted their digital emulations of their programs to sound as much like a, a analog emulation as they could. And so one of the things that they included under the hood was the tolerance knob or the tolerance button. And so basically if this was like a, an analog uh, circuit and this was a mixing board, it would have what is called a, uh, a tolerance. And it simulates basically the component tolerances of the bus circuits. So even if all the channels in the mixer are in theory equal to each other as they are composed by the same electrical components, in practice, these components can be slightly different among the channels, just like on a, a real analog console. For example, a uh, 2K ohm resistor could be actually 1.98 ohms, and that would be on channel 1. But on channel 2, now that same 2K ohm resistor is like 2.03K ohms. And that little bit of the variation in those um, causes it to where there's a little bit of a different sound on every channel, just, just a, a tad bit difference. And so by enabling that, what you're doing is you're basically enabling uh, a slightly different sound on each of the channels. So it's nothing, honestly, I don't use it much because I feel like it's it's another thing that's just kind of eating up my uh, CPU. And so, good question, by the way, though. Uh, waves are always having sales. And they have the Chris Lord Al version. Uh oh, you guys are getting all plug in happy. That can be dangerous sometimes. You get plug in happy, and then the next thing you know. Whew. So, all right, guys, we are officially. Um, let me see how far along we are here. Let's see. We're about 43 minutes into the stream now. This would be a good time for me to go ahead and um, just plug real quickly. If you have not donated in a super chat as of yet, now would be a good time to do so. Anyone who donates any amount in the super chat will get something free from me. And if you have a burning question, we'll guarantee that that burning question gets answered. So that's my quick plug. Just a quick shout out to try to help get some uh, funding for the channel. Um, I'm not going to hunt you down or dislike you or unfriend you on Facebook if you don't. So. The next thing that I'd like to talk about is when it comes to mixing the bass guitar is the, um, we're going to talk about high pass filters in general. So when I pull up a session, generally speaking, the, the first thing that I like to do when I pull up a session is to, and actually I'll, I'll do that now. I'll show you that on screen. Um, let me close this out. Do, 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 do. I'm going to start a, a just a brand new empty project and show you what I'm what I'm talking talking about over here. All right, so let's go back to the desktop real quick. Okay, so here's just a brand new blank session we're looking at. Nothing too fancy. So one of the first things that I like to do whenever I have my tracks imported in is to uh, go to my console view 
and I'll, I'll do it here on the bus channel because obviously there's no tracks imported here. You can't really, so if I move this over here. So one of the first things I'll do though, is if you select in this panel, control a, that's going to select everything in that panel, hold the control button and push this little triangle here for the show hide pro channel that automatically brings them out. Okay. Are you, you following me so far? Good deal. And so now I'm going to hold the control button still while all these are enabled and I'm going to enable every one of them. Okay. So one thing that you can do with the EQ section of this that not a lot of people know about is that you can actually copy and paste from one EQ channel to the next. Now, let me show you what I'm talking about. So it don't work uh, in here. So if I was to cop, try to hold the control button, click and drag here, it's not going to work. However, if I go up here to the small panel and hold control and click and drag, boom, as you can see, it has migrated that over. So <laughs> yeah, it's just, I don't know why you can't do it on both levels, so to speak. Um, but yeah, so boom, there you go. Now, with that being said, what I will do, typically speaking, when I open up a session, I will almost always just right off the bat, every single track will get a high pass filter. And the reason being is because I know that almost every single track at one point in time is going to get a high pass filter anyway. And so you obviously you have to use your ears as to how far is too far. But when every single track has that already enabled, you automatically begin to remove some of those elements of that muddiness that could have, you know, uh, disheartened you or caused you not to hear something properly. Because when those bass frequencies are flying around, man, it's hard to hear a lot of those mids and some of those low mids, you you start making mixed decisions based off of what you're hearing. And then all of a sudden you start, you go to the base, you start mixing it. And now it doesn't want to taint, come into subjection. And you're like, what, what's going on here? And so usually, generally speaking, what it is, is there's just too much base information. You can't make accurate decisions because there's so much base information. So by just putting a high pass filter straight across the board at about 40 Hertz on everything, just right off the bat, you can eliminate a lot of that mud right off the bat too. And then you can get into a better position to start mixing properly. Uh, da, da, da. You know, actually, I, th I think there is a uh, Rosso in response to your question. So if I leave this open, um, I think you can right click up here or is it here? Do, 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 do. Let's see. EQ and plot. No, that's not it. One of these, I believe, allows you to. Ah, insert from track template. Okay, so there's there's templates that you can make for the track. Um, but I believe there's there's also. Ah, here we did. Here it is. So you right click over here in this gray section here. I knew it was on there somewhere. Set modules as default for buses. So if I want all of my buses just as default to have um, the CA2A, we'll, we'll just say that, um, the Bark of Dog, just, you know, randomly, I'm just throwing these in here. I can say, okay, I want these modules to be the default for all buses. Now that's not going to change the buses that are already pre-existing, but what it is going to do is whenever I insert a new bus, what you're going to see is boom, all of those are automatically on there. Now they're not enabled, which is cool. So, and the reason why I say that's cool is because then that would take up a ton of CPU if it was, if you just inserted like three or four buses and that, all that's enabled. Um, obviously you want to pick that, those um, modules sparingly because you don't want everything to come up with the same plugin sometimes. But like obviously like EQ, um, the console emulator, um, that way, if you upload a new, or rather upload, if you insert a new stereo bus, it's automatically going to have the same things that everything else has. So that is, that is one way to do it without a template, Rosso, to answer your question. All right. Very cool. Very cool. 
So that's another another aspect of of getting your base in control. Use that high pass filter. Those things are your best friend. Um, and all of this is included, by the way, in that free download that I talked about. And that can be found at the link that I provided in the chat box earlier. It will be in the description of the video as well. And I'll go ahead just real quickly, in case you missed it, I'll go ahead and post it in the chat section as well, uh, real quickly again. And then if you want to go and download, it's just basically everything that we're talking about right here. And it's all just in one quick sheet that you can kind of take with you. All right, so that comment should be coming in any moment now. There it is. Yes, yes. Uh, hold control. And that will allow you to uh, move those from one place to another. Da, 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 da. I believe you are correct. Yeah, I believe you are correct about the... Um, the untitled section. So basically, if you're not familiar with that, which that's a good point that you just um, brought up there, Keith, I like that. Thank you. So basically, what Keith is saying is that there's the section right here that if I wanted to, I could say, okay, well, this is sort of my go-to setting um, for a bus. So then I can come in here and I can actually save this. This screen here will pop up. And I can say, go to for bus. Okay. And then I just simply save it. And now that's automatically loaded there. So now let's say this one does not have those same plugins that that one does. I can load, go to for bus and boom, there it's all there. Now I don't know. I need to actually check into that because that's kind of helps to answer the question that he had earlier. Um, so if I save it with moves that are made, I think it actually will copy the moves too. Um, don't quote me on that. So if I insert a new stereo bus and do this, yeah, it actually saves those moves too. Very cool. So whatever moves you've made on those plugins is actually going to be saved in that as well. Very cool. All right. Moving on. We're going to talk a little bit more about... Let's see. Okay, so now I'd, I'd like to talk about that 500 hertz range that I talked about earlier, which I believe is sort of the the woolly, I like to call it. It's, it's that the woolly sound. And uh, if you've ever heard it, especially on a, on a subwoofer, you'll know exactly what I mean. It's this sound that it's, it's hard to get out of your ears once you hear it. And it's one of those sounds that you don't really want to hear, but you hear it anyway. And it's like this, yeah, some describe it as woofy, some describe it as woolly, some describe it as, there's a lot of descriptive terms for a lot of things, but it's basically a sound that you don't want to hear. And usually, nine times out of 10, it's found around 450 to 500 hertz. And what you can do is just do a wide cut in that area and um, just kind of dip it down a little bit. And it should bring a little bit more intelligibility to the base. Uh, that's just another quick tip. And yet again, that's in that download as well. If you want to go and check that out. Um, obviously, uh, EQ painting. Okay, so painting. How does painting affect bass? So generally speaking, too, when it comes to mixing, you want, there's certain elements in the mix that will almost always be straight up the middle. Bass guitar is obviously one of them. You don't want to, you don't want to pan your, your bass guitar, well, unless it's a stylistic purpose, but you don't want to pan your bass guitar to the left or to the right at all times. I mean, you don't want also to put any kind of a stereo emulator on the bass guitar because uh, generally speaking, the bass guitar always, always, always goes straight up the middle 
as a mono signal. And I know I say that, and then I have a, a stereo bass in my that my that the customer sent me. But anyway, um, yet again, there are no rules. But generally speaking, you just you want that bass guitar to go straight up the middle, and the reason being for that is because um, you don't want to take up too much room on the sides for your other instruments. And when panning is introduced, this is one of the best things that you can do for your bass as well, is to just implement that panning. What do I mean by that? So your bass guitar is straight up the middle. It's got a lots of bass heavy frequencies going on, but you also have um, a synth and you have a Wolitzer, um, uh, an organ, something of that nature. Now, if all of those instruments were going straight up the middle, yet again, you're running into that same situation where they're all battling one another. And so the best thing that you want to do then is you want to allow that bass to have breathing room. And so you just put it straight up the middle uh, simply because it's a mono signal. It's going to reach to both sides of the stereo field anyway because a mono signal just inhabits it all. Um... Keith says bass is omnidirectional in general, so it's somewhat pointless doing very much with it in stereo unless you're wearing headphones. Exactly. Um, very well put. So bass guitar does not have to be panned. And for the most part, too, unless, like I said, it's stylistic, um, it's not going to benefit you anything to pan that bass guitar. And it's definitely not going to benefit you to put a stereo plug in on it. I know sometimes when you hear a, a, a really good mix... You hear that bass sound that's like in that stereo field that's just, you know, beating your eardrums to death and you love the sound of it. Um, but however, that's a lot of times that's not even, you're not even hearing that bass guitar a lot of times. What you're hearing is another element in that mix that's helping the bass. And what I mean by that is, um, well, a good example is actually with the interview that I did with... Um, John Heyman, who owns the studio in Chesterton, Indiana, uh, Bang Studios, we got to talking on the interview that I did with him about mixing metal guitars, because I don't mix metal, that's not my my forte, and so I brought him on to help maybe those individuals who watch my channel that do, and one of the things that he said um, is he said, you know, a lot of artists and even individuals that he works with in mixing They comment on his mixes and they say, man, how in the world did you get that bass guitar to just thump that much? And uh, the the nasty little secret that he released on that podcast was that nine times out of ten, it's not the bass guitar that's doing it at all. He's left some of the fundamentals of the bass guitar in there, but it's that because the guitars are usually tuned to a drop D, they're already taking up so much low end that he just lets the guitars and the and the kick drum do the work. And if you notice, in a lot of uh, heavy metal, stuff like that, the kick drum is almost very, like, ticky. You hear more of the t -t 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 -t, the beater than you do the actual thump of the drum. And there's a reason for that. Because there's so much bass-heavy information that they know, okay, I've got to sacrifice one thing or another, and guitars is predominantly what the genre, the, the genre is made up of, so you have to let the guitar shine. Now, that's not with every case. Obviously, it's case-by-case -case scenario, but... With that being said, you want to give your bass room. All right, so next thing. Now, okay, so another point that I'd like to bring up is I have actually done this before, and sometimes it's needful. I, I brought this up the other night, that another way to get a great bass sound um, in a less populated mix is to actually create two buses just for the bass. Now, hold on, don't crucify me yet. I'm talking about taming the bass beast and now I'm, I'm creating this three headed Hydra. I've got the bass track and now I've got two separate aux tracks. Uh, okay. But check this out. If, if you do this right, you can create two sins to two separate aux tracks or buses or however you want to word it within cakewalk. And you place your favorite EQ on the channel and you take care of all of the high end on one of those sins and all of the low end on another. And essentially what you can do is now you can process the high end and the low end of that bass guitar differently. So maybe you want to put like a ton of distortion on that low end, but you don't want to touch the high end. 
Now you can blend those to taste without affecting any of the high end. You can just put the, all the grit in the, on that low end. I know that sounds counterintuitive. You know, you're talking about taming the bass beast here and you're, you're talking about making three different channels that are doing bass, but if you do it properly and you do it right, it can actually help you. So now, um, last but not least, uh, I want to talk about the punch because a lot of people, one of the things about bass guitar is they love that punch. Um, a lot of times the punch that you're hearing from a bass guitar is when the bass and the kick drum are jiving well together. And usually if it's a good bassist, usually they will try to play to complement the kick or they'll follow the kick. They even say that in studio sessions, you know, follow the kick or they'll say, um, get a little ahead or a little behind the kick, uh, depending on what kind of sound they're going for. And the reason why engineers or producers sometimes will say stuff like that is because they know, okay, if I can't get this kick and this um, bass guitar to jive well together, there's obviously some kind of a reason. It's because they're fighting one another. So if I can get the bassist to play a little bit behind the kick, then... Of course, you got to have a good bassist and a good drummer. Otherwise, it's going to mess everything up. But um, if you got some good session players or just some good, you know, artists in general, you can make those accommodations just from a production standpoint without having to do all kinds of mixing ninja tricks, without having to be a fader finagler, which, by the way, is my coined term um, that I've been made fun of and everything else. But I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna keep sticking with that term. You know why? Because I like it. I like it. I see myself as a fader finagler. So with that being said, uh, my cat is breaking into my room. One, one quick second. While my cat is breaking into the room, uh, I'm going to go back to and try to get her out of here. I'm going to go to the shout out section. I just want to give these people a shout out real quick. Oh, you got to love live shows. Okay. Big shout out to Luke. Uh, Suhani Wavy. I can't say that name. Kuka Barava. Rob. Roberto. Lahiru Hirotarachi. I'm sorry. I'm going to butcher that name. Pablo. Gary. Jamie. Thank you guys so much for subscribing. You guys rock. Appreciate it. And um, stick around. I'm going to try to have a ton more stuff that's going to help you guys. So what this is all about all right back to the chat section keith says same with edm drum and bass you don't hear much of the kick exactly and a lot of times what you do hear in edm especially is actually more of a gate effect anyway they use the gate effect to sort of create that pumping which sounds like a bass when in actuality all it is is just a uh, an already bass heavy mix that's being sort of uh drown out and put back in and it's just being gated and let back in, and it's that that uh, pumping that's synonymous with that genre of music. So real quickly, guys, we're going to go over the this entire sort of uh, primer, I guess, if you want to call it that. We're going to go over the key points real quickly, and like I said, this is available for download in the link that I provided and in the description of the video. Um, if you are not currently a supporter of the channel, please please, I would definitely encourage you to do so. There are several ways that you can support. I have a Patreon page. I have uh, several products in the description of this video that I am selling, personal products that I've made, and I also have several affiliate links. So if you um, want to purchase anything through those affiliate links, I'll get a small kickback from that. That's another way. Super Chats, PayPal Me. There's all kinds of ways to help support the channel. I would greatly appreciate it, especially now during these trying times with job losses and things like that it would be awesome. Um, obviously, these things are, are not free. It's, it's taking time, which is probably more precious than money right now. But we also do have a lot of it, too. So I'm not going to be mad at anyone if they don't donate or give back. But to those of you that already have done so, thank you so much. And to those of you that are on the fence, I would definitely reconsider. With that being said, we're going to go over the key points real quick. So just real quick bullet points, high pass filters. 
Cakewalk offers very intuitive filtering for the low end through the auspices of the pro channel, which we've already seen. Um, you want to enable them across the board. Um, that control A thing, that little shortcut that I, t I showed you there earlier, where you can select all the tracks at once, select all the tracks at once, and then use the control to enable the high pass filter on every single channel. Obviously use your ears to determine how far is too far per the source material. Uh, you want to focus on the fundamental frequencies. That is important. Every recording will be different, but generally speaking, the bass guitar's fundamental frequencies are around the 70 hertz range. So anywhere that you might boost around in that range, you're usually going to find that fundamental frequency and everything below that you can usually cut, which will give you some room. Use a wide cut about negative 1 dB, negative 2 dBs with a Q of around 0.5, a very wide Q. Uh, around the 450 to 500 hertz range to remove those woolly sounds that you get, the, that muddiness, the muffle. Some people call it like a, a sock on the speaker or someone pulled a blanket off the speaker whenever you dip that out. You'll, you'll hear it audibly. Now, if it's not a problem when you dip that out, you won't hear it, then that's fine. Just don't worry about it. And then uh, we also talked about side chaining the bass if need be to the kick drum. And so... Um, which, by the way, in my course, Compression Simplified, I go in-depth and show exactly how to do that, as well as other techniques that deal with compression. Um, and then we also talked a little bit, not much, about psychoacoustics and how that certain plugins uh, can actually give the, the bass the perception of loudness without it being louder. And the side benefit of that is that it will translate better to small speakers. One plugin that does that by waves, um, see, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about waves, even though I'm have something against them a little. Um, but one plugin that does that by waves is called Max Bass. It's been around for a very long time. And by putting just a little bit of that on your bass guitar, you can begin to hear the bass come through on laptop speakers and even on iPhone speakers. Even though it's just a single mono source, you can actually hear a little bit of bass coming through. As long as you don't overdo it, it won't get too crazy. And then um, saturation. And distortion is your best friend because that not only plays on uh, a small portion of the psychoacoustics, but it also plays a huge deal in the harmonics. If you can start finagling with the harmonics of the bass guitar, that's where it's at because that's why, you, typically speaking, I will always boost around 1800 hertz or 1800 kilohertz rather because that's where uh, you get those finger sounds on the bass. That's where you get that the string sound, the, the sound that kind of makes it translate, poke through the mix a little more. Um, but I like to saturate those frequencies that are on that high end too, so that those harmonics uh, will actually extend into the upper and lower regions and you'll get more of a uh, perceived loudness without the bass actually drowning out as much. So, and then lastly, saturation and distortion obviously can produce good results by accentuating the harmonics of the bass that's otherwise been inaudible, which I just talked about. So I'm basically just reading right now, those quick points came straight off of that download that you'll get if you follow that link. Um, it's called Mixing Bass Simplified. So if you go and you check that out, you can download that, take it with you, and all of these tips will be uh, there for the on the ready. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to the show tonight. Um, I'm going to going to try to be doing these more frequently. So make sure that you have that uh, bell icon uh, selected right next to the subscribe button so that whenever I do go live, it'll notify you. And I've been trying to set these to where they're live, but then they're, they're actually about two hours out. So that way you can actually click that reminder bell too, and it will remind you when I'm going live. Um, other than that, guys, I think I've covered like a ton of stuff here to help you start to tame the bass in your mixes and your masters or even in your tracking. If there's any questions, uh, real quickly, just before I go, if there's any questions that I could cover real quick, like close it out with some Q&A, anything I can cover, post those real quickly, and then I will try my best to answer those as quickly as I can. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and hang out here for a second. Zay, thank you so much, man. Thank you so much. Oh, by the way, I, I don't think I've even told you guys about this, okay? Okay, check this out. 
So on the Patreon page, I am doing something different on my Patreon page than I have seen anyone else do. I always try to think outside the box and try to do things a little differently. And just like with what I'm doing here right now, I always try to, to think too about we're in a home studio. We don't have access to some of these thousands of dollars of gear that other people have access to. However, uh, just like in our motto, dream, achieve, dream, create, achieve, we all do it together. Okay. Now here's what I am doing. This is so, I, I love, I get all fired up when I talk about this. Now, as of yet, I don't think anyone's really caught on to the idea. So check this out. I'm going to, I'm going to make this pitch real quick on my Patreon page. What I'm doing is I'm going to try to get, so you, I have different tiers. So you're like, actually, you know what? I'll just pull that up real quick. I'll explain it while I'm going through it. I, I think you guys will actually see, you'll see kind of my thinking behind this and you'll see how, how cool this could be. Um, and I'm not just saying that because it's, it's my Patreon page. I'm, I'm literally, I think this could be very cool. All right. So if you go to the Patreon page, so inside of Patreon, obviously, if any of you have been there, you know kind of how it works. You have, you know, certain things that you, uh, by opting in, you get access to certain things like posts that only Patreons get, uh, or patrons get. You get access to things that other people would normally not get access to. I'm sure you guys are all smart enough. You've, you've been there, done that, you've seen it, okay? Um, but here is the difference with, my page from others. Okay. I want to show you this. Check this out. So here's the Patreon page. This of course is what it looks like on my end. It's probably not the best, <laughs> best way to show you this. Um, actually, let me see if I can go up here to the, what it would look like, like if you logged in. Da, 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 da. Let's see. Maybe if I just go to Patreon without logging in and like try to find me, maybe that would work. No, that's not what I want to do. Oh, here we go. View a public, view your public page. There we go. Okay, cool. Here we go. All right, guys, I'm getting all excited talking about this. Okay, so you can come in at the base tier, okay, which is a dollar per month. You join a dollar per month, comes out of the account, and it's all safe. It's all through Patreon. Nobody has to take your your uh, information, nothing like that. What you get for a dollar a month is you receive a free downloadable copy of the studio desk plans that I've been selling on eBay for $10. And it comes with, you know, all the plans and everything like you get that just for the dollar a month. And then apart from that, you get in the club, sort of, so to speak, that anytime I upload something that is Patreon, Patreon specific, you get to know about it. So you'll be the first one that gets to know about that. And only patrons can see those posts. And I'm going to try to put things on there, like behind the scenes, like how I record these and how I do my podcasts and how I prepare for, um, interviews, how I prepare for a podcast, just some stuff that I think or how I record electric guitars, just anything that I think might be cool. Okay. But then when you step up to the bronze tier, okay, by doing this, you get a copy of the creating a song step-by-step -step video set series, which is normally $47. And then you also get one entry into the monthly drawing for random gear. Once I reach my goal. Okay. So once I get enough patrons that are, uh, subscribed through this tier system that I'm getting $500 or more a month. I'm going to say at $500. And the reason for that is because, um, so if, if most home studios, like $500 is pretty much like the, the highest end thing that we'll probably ever be able to purchase, you know, and I'm not saying ever be able to, but usually it's like, that's a big purchase for us. Maybe not for like million dollar studios, but for us, that's a huge purchase. And so $500 also is a pretty good price point to get something really killer. So if I can get $500 a month, 
I will then uh, scour the internet for what I feel like is probably the best deal for home studio owners like yourselves. And then I will purchase that with the money that I've made from Patreon. I will then do a review on that piece of gear so you guys will get to see how I would use it, um, its strengths, its weaknesses as I see them. And then um, at the beginning of the next month or the end of the next month, however long that falls into, um, I will have a drawing for that piece of gear. And all of my Patreons who are supporting me will then get to win that piece of gear. So I, I buy it, I test it and try it, and then I give it back to you guys. I think that is a super cool idea. So at $5, you get one entry and a freebie. At $10, um, this is where it gets kind of crazier too. At $10, um, you actually get, let's see. Yeah, at $10, you get three entries. And there's a special offer on there right now that if you sign in for that now, you'll actually get a free mix critique uh, from me as well. Uh, send me a mix and I will share my thoughts in a video form. I'll send you back a video like describing what I might do to change that mix to make it better. So with the $10 tier, $10 a month will get you creating a song step-by-step -step video series, the pro startup template, unless you already have those things, I'll give you something else. And then um, you get three entries into that monthly drawing. Okay. And then the gold tier, which is $20 a month, offers the mix critique as well. You get five entries. You get the compression simplified course, the creating a song step-by-step, -step, and the pro startup template. Now, if you opt in at 50 bucks a month, you get everything that preceded that plus 10 entries. And anytime I release a new product, you will get it for free. So if I release a new, um, I'm actually working on EQ simplified where I go all in depth on EQ recording vocals. I'm working on a course for that too. Um, anything like that. If I release it and you're a $50 a month Patreon, you get it for free, regardless of how much the cost is. And if you're really generous, which I doubt anyone ever will be, but, and I've capped it at two people, you can join the diamond tier for a hundred a month. You get everything that I talked about. You get, uh, all of my, uh, new programs. You'll get those for free. And I will mix and master a song for you once a month. So you send me a song once a month, I'll mix and master it for you. All right. So I think that's pretty cool. I mean, I don't see a lot of people doing that where they actually use that money to buy cool gear, review it, and then give it back to their Patreons. So you guys would already, not only would you already know what you're going to get, but then also you would, um, be able to see it in action. You would kind of know its ins and its outs and, so, all right, I've, I've went on about that enough. Very, very cool. Once again, thank you so much to the chart toppers, James Sheets, Zave Ryan. As of right now, we've got no one that has bumped them out of their positions. They plan on holding those positions tightly. So, uh, we are going to go ahead and end this stream. Once again, I appreciate everybody who has come on board, all of the awesome questions that we've had, all of the awesome interaction that we've had. And I honestly, I hope more than anything that you have learned something. Because to me, that's what all of this is truly about. All right, guys. So until next time, remember, this channel exists to simplify the complexities of the home studio and help you make professional sounding music in a less than professional space. I'm your host, Robert McClellan. Signing out. Love each and every one of you, and I will talk to you later.